We was out at Stanford University one night, and they was out at uh, Fillmore West. And we got a chance to get together then, and what a group. Oh, Jesus Christ. You know, I, I knew I had a lot to learn when I saw them play then. And in regards to what Eric and them say about me, I still think they're one of the greatest three-piece groups that you've ever seen. My first time hearing Cream, I believe, was in about 1967. Um, about, about the same time I heard Jimi Hendrix, I was living in, in Virginia at the time, near Newport News. And I heard the album uh, Disraeli Gears. I heard that before I heard Fresh Cream, and I, and I went back and I found Fresh Cream, and it was a whole different kind of music for me, you know, and, um, so, you know, just like Jimi Hendrix's mu music was really different, it was strange, but what I liked about it is the fact that there was a lot of blues involved in the music, and uh, I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, Jack Bruce and his wailing vocals, I mean, I thought that was really great, and, and the way he played bass, nobody else was playing bass like that at that particular time. Hendrix and us basically had created this, this very large audience of people who were turned on to instrumental, vocal, loud, whatever you want to call it, music, rock and roll, I guess, blues with blues in it. First time I heard of him was uh, actually on the radio. Uh, I think it was Sunshine of Your Love. And uh, the being a drummer, uh, it's just listening to how unique at that time that the, the drumming was it blew me away. I mean, they were, they were, it was simple, but yet it was complicated. And it, but more importantly, it had a lot of feel to it. Rolling Stone wrote an article in, I think, 1967 or 68. It was, will cream stand the test of time? Um, it did, and it will, I think. Um, it was really something extraordinarily good that happened musically. I think it was one of the early um, heavy metal bands, probably, without knowing it. You know, because when they, when we disbanded Cream, and they weren't around anymore, Led Zeppelin filled the voids, so, and they became the first kind of official heavy metal band. So maybe Cream was the forerunner of that. It was just an exciting thing overall to hear him playing together. And you could see the possibilities. And of course, it didn't take very long before it all gelled together and they found the things that didn't work and they found the things that did work and took off from there. And from that point on, of course, it was uh, an extremely exciting thing, uh, as everybody knows. So everybody was such a, a close-knit co musical community. Everybody had to live in London if you wanted to work. Um, and I'd been so familiar with Jack's playing right from uh, the, the very start when he was with Alexis Corners Blues Incorporated and a couple of years before that when he was going around on the jazz circuit playing upright bass with Ginger and uh, Ginger and Graham Bond. So I mean I was, I, I'd heard you know, Jack Bruce for years, so I was well familiar with him as a person and as a player. I mean I'd been playing with Ginger for a long time, we were kind of uh, far out free jazz rhythm section. We used to play places like Flamingo. Um, it was kind of Ornette Coleman, kind of free jazz, really. And, uh, but we also, you know, then we had the R&B thing with Graham. It, there was some festival or other that the Yardbirds were playing at, and we, we all sort of sat in. Eric was, that's the first time I met Eric. He played with the Yardbirds, and uh, we were all on the same circuit of pubs and clubs at the time. Um, and probably about a year before uh, he joined me and left the Yardbirds, you know, he was—he wasn't that remarkable. But uh, you know, obviously, he had—he was the only one you would look for if you were going to hear the Yardbirds at that time, and if you were a blues lover. But it was just remarkable, really, um, how quickly uh, Eric progressed, and that was probably because he had no one to play with, so he, did, he put a lot, a lot of time in listening to records and getting, getting his uh, foundations right. When Eric left the Yardbirds, uh, it was great because he didn't really live anywhere, you see, so I had a spare room at my house and that enabled him to have free access to, you know, my huge, at that time, record collection, which was, uh, you know, pretty hefty blues archive, so he felt it right at home in more ways than one. And then we did listen to so many records together and uh, get excited about them and uh, they found their way into the repertoire.
I especially like the blues material that he did, like, you know, the, the, the live album that came out with Crossroads on it and Spoonful. Those were songs that, you know, I had to spend a whole lot of time in my bedroom listening to what was going on. I thought those were great numbers. So I got fed up with Graham. Graham was going in the opposite direction to where I was going. And I've been running the band for about three years and I decided that I wanted to get my own band together. This is, and the first person that came to mind was Clapton. So I turned up in Oxford, where Eric was playing with John Mayo, and it was in a big hall. Eric saw me in the dressing room. I went in the interval and said, oh man, you've got to sit in, you know? So I said, yeah, I would love to, you know? So, you know, we just, uh, everybody stood up and bang, it, was, it happened immediately. It was really, like, changed the whole gig. So after the gig, I said to Eric, you know, I'm getting a band together. Would you, would you like to join the band? And he said, yeah, straight away. <laughs> Eric said, what about a bass player? And I said, hmm. He said, what about Jack? <laughs> Ginger uh, fired me from the Graham Bond band, but I refused to be fired, you know, because he wasn't even the band leader. Jack and I had had several altercations during the Graham Bond days. I went, I really don't know, but you're right, he's a fucking good bass player. And so I said, I don't know, I'll go and see him. So I went, next day I went round to Jack's place and I haven't seen Jack now for about six months. And I knocked on the door and there was Jack and he was like surprised to see me as well. And we sat down and had a cup of tea and I told him what was going on. So I'd seen Eric and, you know, this thing was happening and did he want to come with us? And he said, yeah, and that was it. Um, it was sort of like, let bygones be bygones, sort of thing. The first time we played was in Ginger's house, a little semi-detached house in Neesden. It was like, out the back was the Welsh Harp, which is an artificial lake reservoir. And the kids all used to play over there, right? It was like fields all around it. And we're, we're playing and it's really happening. And, we're all, and we looked out the back and you could see out through the French windows and up on the hill above was just a pile of young kids, but all dancing, freaking out. They'd all come from all over the Welsh Harp. They'd heard the music and they were digging it. And that was great. You know, it happened. It was magic immediately. You're hanging out, you know, that's... You know, bands start as a result naturally when they when guys hang out. You get three or four musicians that like one another, what they do, then they hang out, then they become a band. It, yeah, it was pretty instantaneous. There was something there, you know, just a combination of, I mean, Ginger and myself, I'd played a lot over the years before, you know, jazz things, Alexis and, and Graham. I mean, uh, with Graham Bond, we played 320 or 330 gigs a year. You know, that's it's... Saves you practicing. <laughs> um, and then the combination of Eric's, uh, at the time, very pure blues uh, playing, and our kind of pushing him beyond what he thought his limits were, I think. It was very exciting. Yeah. The thing about Cream, the interesting thing was that the freedom that there was, that any of the instruments could be the lead instrument on stage, or even on record, I guess. But mainly on stage, at any time, the drums could be playing the melody, you know, or the, or the guitar, or the bass, or the voices, or whatever. When you play and you get into that sort of situation, it's um, as if something else takes over. It's not you're not conscious of playing, but you're listening to this fantastic sound that you're a part of. <laughs> Your part is just happening. It's just happening. It's like total freedom. You can practice forever and get the most amazing technique and say nothing with it at all. Um, if, you, if you haven't got, it's a gift that some people have and we three had it in abundance. 
and it, it so happened that for that period of time that thing really worked to working together just did what he couldn't help but do. <laughs> they did start off obviously with a lot of Eric's input and that would have showed up in, in all the, the blues uh, things that, that maybe Jack and Ginger weren't quite as familiar with. And then the improvisational thing, that's, that's a jazz quality and that's, that's totally where Ginger and Jack came from. They came from a, a jazz background so that was their forte. Um, and Eric, of course, was never playing the same at any night in the, in the Blues Breakers. In fact, none of my musicians ever do because blues is part of jazz and we improvise all the time. It's, it's never the same at any night in a row. But uh, the, 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 the free form aspect of it, where you abandon the changes or appear to abandon the changes, that's a, a jazz device and that was right up the alley of Jack and Ginger. It's interplay and between the musicians, if, if, they, if they were talking, then without their voice, they were talking through their instrument, then that's what you're, that's what you're really hearing. My guitar voice is my voice, and what I sing is you know, what I can't do on the guitar. I mean, and also when you're singing, there are words, you know, there, there's a lyric, there's a lyrical content that you're putting across that you don't, you're not doing with the guitar. The guitar is a, is a universal language. Well, you know, the, what I've always liked about Eric's guitar playing is the fact that he talks to you, you know, his guitar, his guitar playing is conversational and he takes his time, I guess hence the, 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 the name Slow Hand. He was born with the gift and, uh, and, and just had a, had a direction. I don't think I've ever, really, um, until later on in my life, accepted it as a gift, you know, because that's, that takes a bit of um, retrospect. You know, to, to look back and realize that, you know, that it wasn't, it wasn't just a coincidence that you happened to be a guitar player. But at the time, I just wanted to do it because I liked the music, I liked that style. And it seemed to me a little bit strange that I was the only one that did. You know? and, and at the time that I started playing, most guitar players were trying to be, um, follow the white, other white players, you know, and I was much more you know, very racial about it. I wanted to be like a black guitar player, and that to me I, I, is a bit of a you know, strange sort of situation. I've never figured that out. It was uh, between the age of 16 and, seven, and 16, 17 to 20, 21 that, that I put all of my heart and, and learning into it. You know, that's, uh, you know, I forego, I forewent everything else. I didn't go out and go drinking or anything. I mean, I just stayed at home and learned almost 24 hours a day from listening to records, but I was deadly serious about what I wanted to be. That's probably the most important part of it, is being serious about it, or finding a, a kind of music that you like, and not just have it to be pop music or to be popular. You know, your, your motive has got to be right, I think, to be serious about being a certain kind of musician and then fulfilling that. I received a phone call from Jack and Ginger. Um, I didn't have a phone. Right, well, I, well, it was a phone call from the studio saying, we've written this song and we need a lyric for it. Would you like to come down and have a go? They, you see, they both worked with me as, as backing my poetry and music uh, situation, you know. Jack actually did some one or two gigs with me later, but also Ginger worked with me before. <laughs> Yeah, you did a couple of jazz and poetry gigs oh, with I see. Right. On, yeah. on string bass. Remember the Janetta yeah, Cochran sure. Theatre you yeah, did one? Yeah, yeah. But I think really you, you were working with, uh, you were trying to work with Ginger initially. We did to start with Ginger played on that big concert we did in 61. No, I mean like to do it, you know, with, with Cream songs. Well, Ginger I mean, knew me right better. Right at the beginning, yeah. you, you started to work. Yeah. But it didn't, you didn't, it didn't kind of hit it hit off. hit it off, no. I mean, that's right. And, and, and um, I, so I got you... You know, because you, got you didn't the, hit it off. The really. backlash, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was came out of the so-called beat generation, you know, and I was into came out of Kerouac and Ginsberg and all those people. Um, but at the same time, the music that I liked probably had more influence on me than they did, you know, like blues things, Robert Johnson, T-Bone Walker, all sorts of people like that. The, the lyrics of those things probably had a lot more influence on me than other poetry. The process of writing uh, was very much for the music first and then Pete and myself working mm. 
hammering out the images so that, that you know, he's, he's very, uh, you know, he's very kind of prolific. I felt that what I was writing was, I've always felt this, I mean, in the best things that we wrote, I felt that I was just translating the music into words. I felt that it was there already. He would have uh, half a dozen ideas a, a minute, and I would sort of say, no, no, I don't like that one. I can't, you know, just from the point of view of, of singing, you know, things, some things sing better than others. And uh, I mean, I didn't care what it meant, I mean, really. As long as it felt if it good. felt good, you know, yeah. then it, 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 you know, it would work. One funny story is, is uh, is the sunshine of your love story, really, because uh, we were sitting there in, in Bracknell Gardens and we, we, it was like five o'clock in the morning. We'd been writing all the time for, eight, for hours and hours and hours and hours and we were really getting fed up with each other as well. And then suddenly Jack, in desperation, grabbed his double bass. I still remember, this is actually true. I mean, he actually did this. He grabbed his old double bass, you know, and said, what about this? and play this riff. And I went, looked out the window, and it's getting light, you know, so I said, it's getting near dawn. <laughs> <laughs> I got to know Jimmy very well, and we became very close friends. Jimmy, on a TV show once, stopped and went into playing Sunshine. You know, like, he, he really dug cream very much. I was very, very proud to, to be a friend of Jimi Hendrix, and he was very, he encouraged me a lot. He, I think he is not with us because he was, he, because nobody cared about him enough. And I think nobody cared en en enough about us then either. Strange Brew was Hey Lordy Mama, a sort of blues singer, Eric did. And there was a guy in the studio called Felix Papalardi, and we didn't know him. There was Tom Dow and Arif Martin, Ahmed Ertigan, and this guy, Felix Papalardi, who none of us knew. And they introduced him to us. And he said, that track you've just done, he said, would you mind if I took it home and took the vocal off and put a song on top? And we said, no, man, go for it. And um, he came back next day with Strange Brew. That was it. We were, you know, yeah, and he wanted to produce a record and we said, yeah, man, go for it. And he became our producer. Um, he was a great guy to work with. Listen, a band's as good as a drummer. A mediocre band with a mediocre drummer's mediocre, right? A mediocre band with a good drummer becomes a good band. A really good band with a good drummer becomes a super band. The thing that I got from Ginger was that uh, drums are a musical instrument. You know, there's more than just the hits. There are nuances, there are uh, dynamics, there are colors. You've got so many sounds on a drum kit. Not just boom, bash, boom, bash. You've got so many different sounds on a drum kit, depending on how you hit it, where you hit it, you know. Um, and it's using these sounds in the right place that makes the music better. And this, this is what Baby Dodds did and what Max Roach does, what Elvin does, what Art Blakey did, what everybody does. You make the other guys sound good. You make the other guys sound good. That's your gig. The uh, interplay between the band influenced every band that was happening, including Vanilla Fudge, including, you know, probably Hendrix's bands. You know, we used to play with every, all those guys. And it was like, you know, they were like it, you know, the trio, everybody was a superstar. And, uh, and Ginger did a phenomenal job. There were people who may have uh, played double bass before, but nobody played them as a musical separate part the way uh, Ginger Baker did. What he played on the kick drums was, were unique patterns that shifted across what he was doing over the top. Other people played double kick drum, but it was usually just because their one foot wasn't fast enough, you know, and just to speed things up. And I thought that was, that was just one more step. Uh, you really now have four limbs to express two levels of play. That blew me away. I think one of the 
one of the greatest things that I ever heard on drums was uh, Toad. Uh, I'd, I'd never heard anything as fluid before. It just, it was, uh, you know, in drums, you really, you have one hit at a time. It was a very percussive, very short duration note. But yet somehow everything kind of flowed and it, it rolled. I think it was in Texas on the, the big tour, the 68 tour, um, where Eric just said, man, I've had enough. And I said, yeah, man, so have I. And that was it, the end of the gig. Um, we told Stig Wood, I don't know whether he believed it or what. We did what we set out to do, and uh, I think we couldn't have done any more. I think it lasted just the right length of time to, to make the, the little statement that we had. I never thought that I would be in a commercially successful band. I didn't set out to do that. In my life, it, it just happened that way. Uh, I'm very glad that it did, though. It was a great experience. I didn't really ever want to be tied down to a band. I mean, the minute it started to get too, um, too much like a prison or too routine, then I'd want to get out, you know? I mean, just the gypsy side of me, just moving on. It was, it was just the end of it. We did the Goodbye Cream concert at the Albert Hall, and we, we did the Goodbye album, which was some of that tour live, and we did three tracks in LA. Um, and that was it, yeah.